I'll, uh, I'll try to avoid raising my hand. Um, it's a real honor to, uh, to be with everyone today um, to talk about a, a topic that um, actually spans material um, uh, that, that has been um, built up over the course of well more than a decade now. And in fact, between two separate pandemics. Um, this is material that um, I'm actually very excited about. Uh, as a, uh, as a system scientist, as a systems data scientist, an agent-based modeler, uh, but which has, um, for, for reasons of historic accident um, and uh, circumstance, has tended to be under, um, um, under uh, shared, I think. Um, I think that's about to change with um, uh, the, the submission of a couple papers uh, imminent. Um, and, uh, and with the um, completion of uh, my student Winchell Chen's doctoral uh, dissertation, um, which, uh, on which much of this material draws. But um, it's really a, a delight to be able to, to share this material for the first time with uh, such an erudite audience. Um, in order to do so, I'm going to uh, switch to screen sharing, but I see it, it tells me that the host is disabled screen sharing. So I think I'll need some help from Ollie to allow me to, to share my screen. Um, it, uh, it doesn't seem to be allowing it. Okay, I'm now co-host. Um, so I think this will do the trick. And indeed, uh, it's looking encouraging. So... Um, uh, we're we're going to dive into um, this topic um, that <clears throat> confronts uh, the um, the prospects, the opportunities, and uh, the limitations of combining big data on the one hand with uh, with system science uh, more generally and agent based modeling in particular. And <clears throat> I I asked the question in the title, you know, uh, big data for for system science. To what degree is this a luxury, something which is afforded to us by uh, the technological moment and, and progress um, in terms of big data, which can merely sharpen our models um, uh, in their existing uh, findings? Or to what degree is it a necessity to really answer certain types of questions reliably? And I'm going to try to shed light on this answer, even if I can't, um, or on this question, even if I can't fully answer it. So... <clears throat> Um, I'm going to need to move quickly uh, through this talk. Um, I do want to leave some good time for discussion. And the talk has a hard stop because I'm, I'm actually teaching a class formally that begins in half an hour. And I've told the students I'll be half an hour late. Um, and I'll need to switch over to that sharply at the hour. Hopefully many of those students are here. So I thought I'd provide just a bit of context uh, for this work uh, up front, and they, then we can um, dive in to the issue at hand. So this, this work comes out of our, our lab at University of Saskatchewan, many of whose um, uh, prominent members are, are shown here, just uh, antebellum, as it were, just before the pandemic, the cusp of the pandemic in December 2019. Um, and uh, much of the lab has served uh, during my secondment um, uh, to the health system. They, they served alongside me and uh, has continued uh, to make great progress uh, methodologically and in terms of application areas since that point. Um, <clears throat> but while that's a snapshot or a fairly recent snapshot of our lab, the work that I'm gonna be talking about right now and as much as we're talking about agent-based modeling, Harks back many decades. And um, I first started my forays into agent based modeling in the 1980s and my first research applications of it for societal issues in 1990 alongside computational physicists at MIT's Lab for Computer Science between my undergrad and graduate school. And, um, you know, since that time, uh, our lab and me prior to our lab has explored dozens of applications of, um, of agent-based modeling, um, uh, the large majority of them published. Uh, and many of those applications have been um, with a nod towards mathematics for public health in the infectious disease area, spanning from our recent contributions day-to-day -day for decision-making in COVID-19 across two continents as used um, in, in multiple provinces and territories uh, in Canada and in Australia, 
but also extending to issues such as uh, AMR, antimicrobial resistance, um, uh, HPV, um, immunoepidemiological models, zoonoses, and many models involving uh, childhood infectious diseases and, and uh, diseases like tuberculosis, which um, still impose a, um, a troubling burden within Canada. We've also done a lot of work with ABMs with non-infectious diseases over the years. Um, uh, as, a, as a nod from, from, from this slide, um, again, with agent-based and hybrid models being our primary tool. Um, so uh, in this sense, uh, it's really um, with great pleasure that I speak to this ABM uh, group of, of mathematics or public health. But, you know, stepping back, our group is a lot is about a lot more than ABMs and system science techniques. Um, it's it's about bringing together uh, four major areas to shed light in in areas of of, of great import uh, society in, in health, particularly, but also community safety, well-being, uh, social service delivery um, and, uh, and and with some concerns in corrections and policing. Um, these areas uh, include uh, system science uh, techniques as a central component, but um, increasingly that's coupled with a, a set of other uh, spheres, which I won't go into, but where some of our most exciting work is, is currently being carried on, um, including in areas such as applied category theory, where I think really transformative um, benefits uh, can extend to, to the system science area. Um, narrowing down a little bit, this work is about um, this broader enterprise uh, that we're pursuing in our group of bringing together and, in fact, synergizing two distinct and rich computational traditions. Um, system science, um, out of which agent-based modeling and a set of other dynamic modeling approaches flow, but also data science, um, the science of gaining insight um, into, uh, into patterns uh, of, uh, that are observed from the world, but also the, the processes that give rise to those patterns um, from empirical data using computational methods. Um, and uh, we've tapped, uh, since the 1990s, I've been intrigued by the potential for big data, and we've tapped this uh, over decades now to inform um, our modeling. Um, uh, and uh, in some cases, forays with, uh, with machine learning. So our lab is, is kind of a center point for making use of, uh, of big data sources, um, uh, extending from smartphone-based data, you'll hear a lot about, and, and mobile sensor data uh, prior to, prior to the, the large, widespread availability of smartphones, uh, Zigbee-based systems, for example, but also um, search data and social media data, um, data from channels like... Uh, uh, like Twitter, um, but also uh, turning to things like Tumblr or, or Reddit, other social media channels. Wearable technologies um, and wastewater assays arguably are in this sphere when conducted frequently enough with high velocity. And point of sale data has been another area we've, we've explored just a little bit. Um, in my view, system science techniques and agent-based modeling amongst them, you know, fits into a broader landscape um, of contemporary computational informatics tools for, for deriving insight into the world. Um, it is not um, coextensive with those other techniques, but it hybridizes uh, wonderfully, and I would argue synergizes with those techniques to, to yield something where the sum is greater than the, uh, th than just, uh, or the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and to this end, we've applied uh, a number of techniques that I, I view as um, meriting a designation, not just of system science techniques or data science techniques in isolation, but really systems data science techniques, where the two are joined at the hip. And I've, I've listed a number of them here. Not surprisingly, these form the basis for uh, much of my fields course that I'm teaching right now and to which I will turn in after the closing minutes of this session. But... Um, uh, today uh, is about informing this joint understanding, but it's about understanding um, the opportunities and limits of big data in informing, um, informing models. Um, and so to, to address this, I, I want to talk about big data. And big data is a sphere that uh, most people on the call will recognize um, 
uh, has uh, a lot of hype associated with it. Um, and I think uh, much of that hype uh, over the years has been um, more a matter of image and um, and more superficial uh, than might sometimes be be discussed. But I actually see there's a tremendous significance to big data. And uh, I'm, I'm rather partial to, um, to Google's definition of big data as, as data that, that is characterized by the four Vs. It's high volume, that's the big. It's high velocity. And that's really of importance when it comes to dynamic modeling, because dynamic modeling is, by definition, about understanding the behavior of systems over time. And, and big data help, helps shed light on it. Um, but it's also characterized by uh, variety and the final V um, by in certain spheres, including those explored here with locational behavior and contact patterns, greater veracity than self-report. Um, it, it can, uh, with lower burden and with higher reliability, measure things such as contact patterns and mobility patterns, which would otherwise be um, be quite prohibitive with um, traditional direct observation or diarizing. Um, now, we've been pleased to contribute in the big data space um, in a number of different spheres to data collection systems. Some of these are more basic, such as um, social media-based harvesting that's been going on in our lab for a better part of a decade. Um, on a very reliable uh, basis, um, every 15 minutes or so, we, we grab a bunch of social media data so we can analyze it. But, um, but it's also involved a big investment in um, sensor-based data collection and particularly smartphone-based data collection. And a large part of this work has been spun off, um, uh, the, again, the better part of a decade ago, about six years ago into a company, uh, Ethica Data Company, which, which um, uh, has been used for hundreds of studies worldwide, somewhere over 300, over 25,000 participants, and uh, with hundreds of different educational institutions, as well as health systems being clients. Uh, this is a system that runs on smartphones and, and has a web-based interface as an alternative if for people who don't want to download apps. Um, and uh, it's a powerful tool for collecting self-report data but in a way that's richer than traditional self-report, for example, allowing audio and camera and video recording and geotagging. But more than that, it allows for monitoring uh, sensors. Um, and all of this, you can deploy new studies with this literally within hours with no custom programming and push it out to commodity phones and with interfacing to the informed consent process, et cetera. Um, it, it uh, aspired from the start to pick up uh, dozens of, of sources of sensor data. So whether it's uh, matters of people's use of the phone and screen state and app usage, or uh, activities in which they're engaged or their steps, or whether it's things of more direct interest to this talk, um, understanding mobility patterns and what it tells us about contact between people and more directly, measuring contacts using Bluetooth and, and Bluetooth beacons like this one here. Um, uh, this is a system which uh, is empowered to, on a case by a study by study basis, you can enable which, if any, of these data sources you want to accompany your surveys or you want to collect all through the day um, from uh, those who have undergone informed consent um, to, to participate in the study. And you know, through um, dozens of studies that I've been involved in and hundreds worldwide, massive amounts of this data have been collected. Uh, this from a study with Harvard uh, School of Public Health involving tobacco, ex uh, tobacco messaging exposure, just illustrating some of the movement patterns of participants so in the area of Houston, Texas. Um, this from earlier work uh, where we were looking at uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth localization of spaces in which people circulate and contact patterns in that space. We've used GPS to look at contacts and people's gathering patterns around a city um, after or before work hours um, uh, and, and during work and, and examine how that's changed um, and examine how the networks by which people interact with each other evolve over time. Say in week one here, 
versus week two, this drawn from Bluetooth data. So a given link between participants indicates um, with its width, how long they spent in, in proximity to each other within some estimated distance range. So all of this can be deployed literally within hours um, to willing participants with, um, with no programming being involved. Um, we have a very, um, uh, a very flexible epidemiological collection uh, platform that you know, I set out to build in the late part of the 2000s and which has for a long time now been widely deployed. Um, and that raises opportunities. Um, for infectious disease transmission, one of the central guiding motivations for creating the system and uh, employing and deploying it has been the interest in gathering understanding of people's contact patterns and how contact related behavior changes over the course of, of time and, and in the course of pandemics being of central interest. Um, and, uh, you know, at the start of it, um, I took it as uh, a likely working hypothesis that the sort of data we could pick up on people's contact patterns, this sort of data and their changes over time would likely um, allow us to better uh, anticipate how uh, interventions might, um, uh, might lower the burden of infectious illness through prevention efforts, through control efforts, but also might um, might allow us to better anticipate, you know, uh, cases in, in coming uh, days and weeks. Working closely with health systems, this was something that I, I thought could be an asset to our partners um, day to day within the context of pandemic response. Um, and uh, now that we've built the systems for collecting this sort of data, um, uh, starting in 2009, um, uh, you know, the, the question increasingly came to the fore, how much is this helping? To what degree is this merely uh, sharpening and, and refining some of what we're finding um, with uh, more aggregate models? And to what degree is it, really, um, is it really important for answering reliably certain questions? To what degree is it going to make a big difference? Or to what degree is it going to just um, tune the you know, a couple uh, points after the decimal point, uh, a couple of digits after the decimal point um, without really affecting the big gains. Um, now, um, in order to pursue this work over a number of, um, number of years, it's been about 12 years now, we've pursued a variety of what I like to call data knockout experiments. So using high resolution empirical data, we formulate experiments that approximate that data um, or subsample that data in various ways. And uh, by so doing, we, um, we arrive at synthetic data sets that are like the original in their basic features, but are um, simplified or reduced in scale, the sort of thing we might get through um, a less aggressive form of data collection, a less frequent form of data collection, a more aggregated form of data collection. And then we compare the results for, um, uh, for running transmission models on those, uh, those uh, simplified data sets um, with what we would get in the full scale data set. So we compare the outcome. We say, how does it affect our tax rate? How does it affect the probability of whether an outbreak occurs? Um, in other words, to what degree uh, would we be fooled if we merely sampled less frequently, say once a day or once a month, um, people's contact patterns compared to every five minutes. Um, how would that affect our sense of how likely an outbreak is in the next little bit? Or how likely a given person is in, based on their position in the, in the social network, the contact network to being infected? These are the nature of these data knockout experiments. And we've conducted them in a variety of areas related to infection transmission. I'm gonna be talking about three such studies today. And for these studies, I need to give foremost credit um, to, to the parties involved, to Winchell Chen, um, uh, out of whose work uh, this, uh, 
uh, the vast majority of this flows. And Mohammed Hashemian, who uh, was a master's student when he started the work, led our, our study for the 2009-2010 flu pandemic, uh, uh, H1N1 pandemic, um, but has gone on to become uh, the CEO of, of Ethica Data, which is running a, a burgeoning business in these sort of epidemiological data collection systems with sensors. Um, so the first, um, these three studies that I'm going to be presenting, I'm going to have to go quick and, um, and cover them at a very uh, light level, and I can come back and dive in in response to questions um, to make sure that we get time for questions. Um, so the first study is not the first chronologically, but I think conceptually it's the, it's the, the highest level one. And this is a study led by Winchell here um, as, as an important part of his doctoral work. Um, it studied the impact of sensing modalities. Um, how do we sense contacts? We can, we can measure contacts between people in, um, in, in several different ways, but one of the, two of the most popular ways are with Bluetooth or with uh, G, uh, GPS. Um, uh, so this is a system to estimate people's location. It can be based on cell tower locations and satellite measurements and Wi-Fi. All these form uh, jointly take into account are taken into account what's called assisted GPS. And each of them, uh, Bluetooth and assisted GPS, can give us some way of trying to quantify contact patterns and how they're changing over time. And each of these modalities um, has different trade-offs. I showed earlier, you know, GPS mapping of context um, and Bluetooth-based mapping. And I want to I want to uh, share with you this wonderful diagram recently created by Winchell, which um, tries to illustrate how these take place. So if I have a smartphone and if I'm this person in red here, um, uh, and I want to find uh, who said contacts with me uh, within the participant population. Um, we can look at using Bluetooth um, by using what's called, whoops, sorry, the received signal strength indicator. This is a measure of the strength of the signal received by my phone as it listens to transmissions from other participants' phones. And uh, it turns out that the uh, received signal strength indicator, um, as you might expect from radio frequency uh, propagation considerations, it uh, the strength of the signal declines with distance. Um, and you can relate the strength of the signal um, that as received to distance in empirical formulas that researchers have studied and which are captured in in Android libraries, et cetera. Um, so uh, based on what I hear from people around me and from their phones of other participants, um, I'll be listening to see, you know, what, uh, what strength of the signal is that I receive from others. And based on that signal strength, I may classify them as being a certain distance from me. And when we consider my contact patterns that lie within a certain distance, say within three meters or within five meters, um, uh, I would consider a subset of these people, those who have um, a signal strength indicator stronger than the requisite threshold that will be suggested by five meters or three meters. This is one way to measure contact patterns, and it's a very readily accessible way. When we started this work, you could do it with commodity smartphones uh, with abandon. Um, but uh, these days, because of security tightenings on both the Android and the Apple program, it's increasingly pursued through Bluetooth beacons, which can be placed in wallets or, or uh, worn or uh, placed in pockets, um, et cetera, um, to, to help ensure that we're not uh, eavesdropping on, on, on people's phones who aren't interested in being tracked. Ethica has um, very sophisticated ways of, uh, of, of allowing people to opt out of data collection, but um, what we've seen is a change in smartphone platforms to ensure that in general, Bluetooth is not used to assess 
a, a signal strength um, without someone's permission by by requiring use of beacons. So the, the 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 ease of applying this has changed and has been constricted a bit over the years. GPS is therefore a, a, a somewhat more ascendant method. And the idea with GPS is, look, if these are other participants in the study, each of them could measure their GPS position. And you could then take their differential position, look at where they are relative to each other and assess distance. Um, and uh, you would just classify people who, who are within a certain geographic distance as measured through GPS. As, as being in contact with each other. That's the basic idea. Um, just as Bluetooth had some issues, um, so, so GPS uh, locationing also has issues. I see Parisa had a question and I'm glad to answer that question. Yes, Parisa. Okay, I'm not, not hearing a thing. Maybe I'll, I'll just check in the chat here. Um, uh, Huge issues, Bluetooth pings being too sensitive for creating contact networks. This is not what we found through dozens of studies. Um, we found that actually by uh, appropriate care, you actually can, uh, and mind you, it requires some uh, da serious data cleaning, um, that uh, these sort of pings uh, can be used with appropriate uh, analytics associated with them. Uh, this is a study in which we, a, a set of studies which we published extensively, and it matches some other studies from some of our collaborators. So um, I, I agree that it's not easy, uh, but nor do I agree that it's a foregone conclusion. It's impossible. I actually, uh, we, we have found quite a lot of consistency um, in what we can derive. Um, uh, issues of Bluetooth, uh, people turning Bluetooth tooth off. Absolutely. And this is something which Winchell's uh, work uh, extensively examines. I didn't see a question there from Parisa, but uh, here we go. Um, you consider people near to each other, yes, to be in contact with each other. Essentially, that's correct. And so if there's drywall between each other, if they're in cubicles, for example, or, or in, um, in you know, co-located uh, co offices right next to each other, um, this is one of the downsides of it. These are not perfect techniques. Um, uh, but they are better than self-report by a long shot. And our studies where we have asked for reporting via self-report and uh, these sort of uh, measurement techniques have borne that out. Um, uh, we get vastly higher attrition when you ask for self-reporting. Um, so uh, these are these two detection modalities. In the interest of time, I'm, I'm going to uh, go light on further comments there, but I'm glad to to comment on the Winchell's dissertation is a deep dive into using Bluetooth and GPS for specifically for proximity detection for infectious disease, for contact detection. Um, so uh, this work draws on um, uh, a, a set of studies which we've run over the past 15 years or so which go by the name, uh, the SHED studies. Uh, these are the Saskatchewan Health Eco uh, Ecological Data Sets or Ethology Data Sets. Um, and the particular ones examined here are, are smaller in size. Um, Ethic has been used with many thousands of participants for some studies, but the ones examined here are, are smaller with dozens of participants. Um, they are, however, distinguished by longer durations. Uh, we were looking at a minimum study length of about um, about a month. Uh, and uh, for some studies, we had multiple months. Um, so, uh, you know, one thing that you'll see if you look at uh, uh, trying to assess uh, co-location with Bluetooth on the one hand, um, with different distance thresholds um, versus GPS with different distance thresholds, is you, you see a quite different picture. With GPS, uh, you're picking up a lot uh, fewer contacts. Um, on average, and while there are some conserved contacts here uh, between the two, what you see as kind of frequent contacts is actually rather different for more um, fine-grained resolution or less fine-grained resolution of Bluetooth versus GPS. Um, the uh, the two are not simply, you know, GPS is not simply a subset of the Bluetooth ones. 
And one of the issues that, blue, that uh, GPS has that's of major significance in the area of infectious disease concerns is uh, very poor receptivity within buildings. Um, urban canyons are also an issue, but in general, uh, GPS receptivity in larger buildings tends to be very poor. Of course, it's indoor environments with pathogen transmission is of greatest concern, and big buildings with lower ventilation sometimes are of particular concern. Bluetooth uh, does not have that concern, GPS does. Um, GPS also tends to have an issue with, with measuring uh, spatial co-location, which is uh, a false in a false positive sort of way. Um, so under these different uh, modalities, um, we've examined, um, for example, pictures of contact time or, or inter-contact time, um, how much time people spend together. Um, these are complementary cumulative distribution functions. And as you can see, what it shows is that if you're measuring with GPS, you think that people are spending a lot more time um, uh, in common um, than if you're measuring with Bluetooth. Um, and the inter-contact time, the time between contacts, um, is also subject to some variation. Mind you, this is a log scale here, and it's a log scale on the x-axis as well. So it's a log-log plot. And so uh, a given gap here is a gap in more than an order of magnitude between, on the one hand, Bluetooth, what you pick up with Bluetooth, uh, comparatively shorter pictures of duration, um, more fine-grained duration, and with GPS, which is longer. Um, when we plug this into an agent-based model um, and we examine it with parameterizations of that agent-based model, which are suggestive of different pathogens, um, we, uh, we see some marked difference comes out, coming out. If you're using Bluetooth data as kind of your source of ground truth, um, we know it's not, but if you are, are using that with appropriate data cleaning and pre-processing, to, to use it intelligently, what you will find is that often your measurements are um, quite different from what you expect from GPS. This is not true over the board. Um, for example, um, with certain data sets, we have uh, less measurement, uh, we have less, um, uh, less of a disparity than with others. Um, and with certain uh, types of pathogen or, or disease, we also get some um, some very, um, very big changes in how disparate the results are from Bluetooth on the one hand or for GPS on the other. Um, uh, we, can, we can have some where, uh, some data sets where there seems to be quite modest difference and others where the differences are pronounced. In general, fast spreading infections uh, such as measles, um, uh, which, which is highly, highly communicable, you can see marked differences between the burden that you'd expect in terms of attack rate from Bluetooth-based measurement measured connections versus GPS. So here, the, the implications of this are, you know, ABM transmission outcomes can be sensitive to whether we measure contacts from Bluetooth or GPS. It, it can matter. Bluetooth-based measurements uh, exhibit, um, uh, in general, uh, higher... Um, variability, that's the sort of larger blue confidence intervals around this mean here uh, for, for Bluetooth compared to GPS. And that is something which you see in many studies. But um, they also can offer significantly higher mean attack values, attack rate values as well. Um, and uh, Bluetooth-based contact measurements do offer considerably higher resolution, it seems, in terms of the contact patterns that are picked up. Now, um, continuing on to discuss this, um, a second study examined uh, temporal uh, aggregation impacts. So here, we were using, actually, truth is, neither Bluetooth nor GPS. This is an earlier generation of what are called Zigbee-based sensors, um, and particularly uh, Zigbee was a low-power uh, low sensing modality popular in the late uh, 2000s. Um, 
and uh, we we engaged in some custom programming of of sensor based platform to to pick up uh, these sorts of of contact patterns. The contributors here were Winchell, but also Mohammed, who did a lot of the original programming. Um, uh, that paper is uh, is shared back uh, back in 2012. Uh, we published it, and all these results can be found. The, this was based on a study run during the H1N1 flu pandemic um, for three months, 92 days. Um, and uh, we had uh, between 35 and 40 participants once you, uh, once you did data cleaning, et cetera. Now, um, what we examined in this study was the effects of aggregation and, and truncated data collection. Um, so some of the aggregation strategies we examined, there were many of them. Some of them involved uh, taking a dynamic network as measured by the, by the sensors and aggregating it up um, into a weighted graph of connections and using that weighted graph. Others of them involved approximating things such as the aggregated contact duration in a piecewise way um, with uh, with uh, certain parametric or non-parametric uh, characterization, so that we could draw in, draw uh, through each realization of a model from these distributions or their parametric analogs, and um, this provides a, a bit of a summary of what we looked at. Um, uh, so we were looking at uh, data. Um, in a uh, most uh, disaggregated form, that's full, fully detailed, that's full D. Um, that's the maximum temporal resolution. Uh, also in a, in a fully aggregated fashion, that's a static weighted graph um, where we, we just aggregated up, took one graph for the entire 92 day study period as synthesized from this microcontact data. Um, this is about the best weighted graph you're going to be able to come up with. And then we took a look at a set of other strategies. Um, some where we looked only at, at um, replaying a single day over time, picking different days, um, and, or some where we, we focused on one day, but we aggregated it up and we replayed that day many times. And long story short, um, what we're looking here is kind of cumulative number of infections uh, across 10,000 realizations here on the y-axis. Um, and what we're seeing is variability. These are a bunch of approximation methods based on the, uh, these inter-contact time and, and uh, inter-contact duration um, types of measurements uh, with various fits to the distribution. And what you find is a factor of about two between what you'd expect to see in terms of uh, infection spread with a fully aggregated network versus a fully detailed network. Uh, and um, the fully detailed network um, is based on all 92 days. If you just pick a single day um, and you were to iterate um, picking different days at different times, you get very, very large variability. And in fact, we looked at different combinations of weekdays and weekend pairs, for example, this again back in 2012 uh, publication. And uh, what we found is that, you know, different combinations, if you pick a day as typical, which was not unusual in the, um, the early days of, um, of uh, uh, sensing based on um, electronic proximity detection, what you found is that you could get highly variable results. Um, there was no typical day, just like epidemiologically, it's a problem to talk about the typical person. Variability matters. Um, we know that with scale-free networks. Um, you know, the basic reproductive number is the mean plus the, the ratio of the variance to the mean, for example. Variability matters. Um, and, uh, and so it is with variability between days. Uh, aggregated weighted graphs give a different picture from the maximal resolution one, but you also get a very different picture if you just focus in on a single day and you assume that's your typical day and just extrapolate from there. Length of the study matters. Um, so weighted static approximations to networks can, can change results, can change attack rate estimates by 
by integer factors, by a factor of two or more. Um, and they tend to overestimate the attack rate. They tend to assume an opportunity of bug to transfer from one person to another at, uh, on a continual basis where those connections are merely episodic. Um, static networks that use these sort of weighted distributions um, uh, that use distribution drawn measurements, we actually found could be somewhat um, counterbalance, have counterbalancing impacts that could lead them to, um, to actually come quite close here to the fully detailed measurements. They, they kind of have a set of tensions on them when you're drawing from, from, distribu from fitted distributions that can actually allow them to perform pretty well. Um, and most importantly, we found, you know, measuring one day is just, you're going to be fooling yourself if you think you're going to gain a lot more accuracy by measuring one day. Um, that's just not enough. People's variability day to day is, is, is much, uh, much more extensive than you'd pick up there. The third study, and again, uh, conscious of, of wanting to finish up here, um, looked instead at the required frequency of sampling. This again was led by Winchell. And here we, we used an SEIR model to examine the impacts of, of sampling rates at different rates, every five minutes, every 10 minutes, every 15 minutes, et cetera. Now, Winchell's dissertation and the associated paper here goes into this in vastly more detail. Um, he was looking at uh, impacts on perceived contact networks. He was looking at multiple downsampling strategies and a broader set of pathogens and disease uh, diseases. I'm just giving a, a small picture of this. Um, and, uh, and yet, it, I think it's kind of emblematic of what you'll see more generally. So here we have five different of our studies. And here we have uh, a set of of eight different um, uh, pathogens or disease uh, diseases. And we parameterized our agent-based model to sort of act like these diseases. So measles spread more quickly than flu, for example. And we had a couple COVID-19 uh, variants of concern in the original paper. I think it's three of them and, and, and chicken pox, uh, some, some childhood infectious diseases, pertussis as well, et cetera. And uh, we were looking for each study with the particular contact pattern seen in that study, um, which uh, tended to, to, to occur over a, a month or more. Um, if we were to sample every five minutes um, contacts versus every 10 or 30 or, or up to every three hours, uh, sorry, this is three hours, this is six hours, how would it change our results? And um, in terms of uh, infection count, cumulative infection count, or equally much so uh, attack rate, what we found is actually, uh, once again, certain pathogens and diseases um, led, uh, had big changes um, in what you would anticipate for attack rate if you were sampling most frequently versus less frequently. And generally for, for this method, which is the snapshot method, method of downsampling, where it's just like every five minutes you're waking up, measuring the contacts and going back to sleep, um, which is not a bad approximation for what occurs on, a, on, on the smartphones indeed. Um, what you're seeing is higher attack rates actually being picked up if you sample frequently. You're picking up the short contacts that can bring pathogen from one person to another. If you're only sampling every, every six hours for a minute at a time, um, you wake up every six hours and you sample for a minute, you go back to sleep for another six hours, um, you get a marked uh, lowering of the number of infections that you think occur. The same thing is true for a couple of these bugs, chickenpox, pertussis, measles. It tends to not be as true for others, interestingly. You could see some of these more or less flat curves. And uh, interestingly as well, there's an interaction with the network structure. These studies were undertaken in uh, on network structures that were rather different with different subpopulations. And they tended to have different levels of sensitivity uh, for this. Um, I wanna finish up here to allow questions. I will say Winchell's uh, uh, contributions have examined this at a much uh, stronger level yet. Um, another thing he did was to examine how does the frequency of sampling 
lead to uh, bias in your median expectation of how many people are infected um, versus your, um, your, your uh, deviation from what you pick up with most frequent sensing for interquartile range, for the variability. Um, and uh, not surprisingly, if you are sampling infrequently, uh, it tends to lead to greater, uh, greater bias uh, in, in terms of the attack rate, and it, it, it tends to understate the attack rate, and it, it also leads to greater uh, variability in terms of the uh, perceived uh, attack rate that you pick up. So the implications of this study is um, uh, the model representation of contact dynamics, and particularly how frequently the data you're depending on to instantiate that model, to parameterize it as sensed, is, um, uh, is, is uh, something that's fairly sensitive. And, and it can lead to changes in model results by a factor of, of two or more. Um, the, the temporal fidelity uh, with which these contacts are, are picked up is, is therefore a, you know, a sizable issue when it comes to factors of two or three. Um, and uh, the sampling frequency required to represent a condition depends on two big factors. One is the nature of how quickly that bug spreads in the population. Its uh, basic reproductive numbers is a good proxy for that. And then secondly, it's based on, um, uh, on the, the, the structure of the networks you're picking up. If you have a network which... Um, it tends to have a very clustered uh, population with very high density. You can get um, uh, rather different measurements and sensitivity than if you get one that's more, uh, that's more sparse. Okay, so just uh, a few closing remarks here. Um, uh, Microcontact data offers great opportunities for, for infectious disease uh, transmission models. And for some research questions involving transmission modeling, um, microcontact data um, can really sharpen your sense of infection spread um, from what you would expect by a, a, even the best informed aggregate model by an integer factor. Um, uh, and it seems reasonable to surmise that it might expect it might impact the relative gains that you might expect from different types of intervention. Uh, Im you know, uh, 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 a, uh, immune, uh, a response, an outbreak triggered immunization campaign versus a uh, uh, campaign in, uh, that's that's instead aimed at in enhancing mask use or or encouraging people to remain at home or what have you might have rather different uh, uh, different infection spread impacts. We can often evaluate high resolution data um, for its value by conducting these kind of knockout experiments. And these studies can be conducted um, uh, to investigate other aspects of study design as well. Um, and in my own view, uh, I think this work offers a lot of value, but um, to take it further, we'd really need to look at venue specific types of data collections, whether it's long-term care facilities, acute care, home care, dialysis facilities and chronic care facilities, schools, um, where we might, uh, we might pick up actionable um, findings involving um, uh, the frequency with which we need to, sen to sense and the modalities with which we need to sense. Finally, I'll, I'll just note, if anyone's interested in this intersection of this sort of work um, with, with our own, we do offer a boot camp on understanding health behaviors with smartphones and wearables. Uh, we last offered it in 2019 in the run-up to the pandemic, um, and we do it by request. Uh, but I've also got the Systems Data Science Boot Camp this summer, as well as an agent-based and hybrid modeling boot camp that we're running as we have since 2012, with the exception of the pandemic. Okay, so those are all my comments here. I'd be glad to answer questions in the remaining time. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Asgut. Um, there is one question. I don't know if we, uh, you answered that before or not from Martin on the Q&A uh, portion. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. um, 
So uh, I'm looking, I know I commented, um, tried to uh, address two of Martin's questions earlier, but I, I'm not sure if there's a new one. Um, this was probably a new one, yeah. Uh, it is uh, starting with how big is an issue between one urban area having underground transit versus the one yeah. that doesn't have, or uh, skyscraper versus not, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so um, underground transit and skyscrapers tend to pose first order problems for, um, for satellite-based GPS localization. Now, um, if one's looking at assisted GPS, um, you can get some, some value in some of those cases from, um, from GPS that's, that's uh, informed by um, Wi-Fi router um, uh, knowledge on the part of uh, GPS providers. So in other words, um, you know, Google drives through towns and observes the, the Wi-Fi routers that are visible um, with their cars. You may have seen them. And um, part of that is to inform uh, better localization um, uh, in, in assisted GPS uh, so that they can recognize something about people's location um, informed not just by satellite, but by Wi-Fi. Um, I think in skyscrapers and underground, those are both going to be problematic. And uh, I think there, what you really need is Bluetooth-based localization. Um, and as I say, uh, said in response to Martin's comments, Bluetooth-based localization it needs to be under it needs to be addressed as a um, uh, as as something which requires a lot of data cleaning and savvy um, savvy treatment. Like you can't just take Bluetooth data and shove it into your model directly. You have to be savvy about how you're using it and, uh, and about what it tells you and what it doesn't, um, and imposing uh, thresholds reflective of that. Um, but I think those, those types of measurements will be valuable in both those environments, indoor environments where GPS is not going to penetrate effectively. I will say this, though, um, that um, beyond these measurements, there are you know, uh, companies now, um, one of them uh, led by a, a colleague of mine, Shiro Pituto, for example, which use these sociometric badges, which people wear um, and which can be very effective. We've also made heavy use in some of our studies of Bluetooth beacons. Um, and uh, those, uh, those can also be, uh, uh, be, be effective tools for picking up, um, con uh, picking up contacts in a more reliable way. But I would say Bluetooth is, is you know, the main point of focus or sociometric badge, uh, the custom protocols, proprietary pro protocols, yeah. Uh, I see uh, John Hong has raised his hand. If you have time, uh, we can no, go No, I raised the hand because I want to remind you that Nathan said he has to go to lecture at one o'clock, so uh, just yeah. in case. Uh, yeah. Hosting cam, I heard a lot of uh, demand from from the network members. I heard they really would like to run container. <laughs> okay. Um, Nima, do you want to ask a question on chat or Q and A? Yeah, I'll, I can take one or two more questions. I don't think my my students will be uh, will be disappointed here. Um, if if I um, so I, I see um, Nima. Um, had said uh, there was going to be a, a question um, here um, uh, in the chat um, or by raising hand. Nima, do you want to go forward? No? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, hi, everyone. Hi, Professor. I'm Nima Ting from Kathmandu, Nepal. And I'm watching your, I was excited to know about this agent based modeling. And I'm particularly new in into this field. I'm currently doing my research design project on uh, qualitative research, but I also wanted to have some computational method. And uh, the, um, the one thing that reminds me and uh, noted is uh, agent-based model. So my question is, is it then, uh, is it applicable to all the projects, uh, computational projects that we do, or is it, does it have some limitation? For example, the project I'm doing is to see the perception of farmers in Nepal uh, to see how the digitization in agriculture is helping them. 
So is, uh, do you think agent-based modeling could be applied to into such context or should I stick to my traditional uh, qualitative uh, research uh, design? I hope you understand. Uh, okay, so, you know, yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you, uh, Nima. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll mention, um, you know, some comments in response to it. Um, so, so agent-based modeling um, is a versatile tool. There's no question that it offers uh, many, many points of value, but it's, it's one tool in a toolbox. And, and I think it's best undertaken in, in, a, um, in a recognition of, of where its unique strengths are and where, it's, um, uh, where other tools can complement it and indeed uh, synergize with it. Um, so uh, qualitative research, in my mind, is, is a very powerful tool. It's a very important tool. Um, uh, and, you know, in general, our models capture theory, and, um, and that theory is informed when we have qualitative as well as quantitative data to inform them. So it's not a matter of one or the other entirely. I recognize your time is limited. But, um, uh, you know, in general, it's, it's not forsaking one to do the other. It's, it's using both together to bait its effect. Um, Agent-based modeling in Canada, I sometimes perversely see it treated as a AI method, an inference method. Um, I do AI all the time. I, I use machine learning extensively. Um, Agent-based modeling is not an AI method. I mean, it's, it's not an inference method. And um, I think uh, it, it, in terms of arriving at, um, you know, doing data analysis to arrive at an estimate of some underlying quantities, sometimes people imagine that it's, it's kind of uh, a, a, a universal machine learning method and, and far from it. But what it does do is allow you to capture, you know, multi-scale effects. It allows you to capture uh, network context and spatial context very richly, it allows you to ca capture heterogeneity and, and uh, behavior over time, longitudinal progression of individuals um, over time and, and compare that with empirical data or calibrate it. It's, um, it's an extremely versatile tool for building in context. But uh, th there is a proviso here, Nima, which is um, you know, when you apply it, um, it's so flexible that it's easy to to go down a rabbit hole and get caught up and, and uh, in, in just sort of the mechanics of going through it and not, not get inside out. I believe it's best undertaken together with other complementary modeling tools as well. I'm a big believer in you know, combining it with, uh, with, with other system science techniques like compartmental modeling, system dynamics modeling, discrete event <coughs> simulation. Um, but uh, if you're just getting started, you really need to have a mentor who can talk with you about it and will hold guide it because there's an apprenticeship that's needed for this sort of work to, to avoid, um, you know, to provide the requisite support, I think, to get going. Um, those are some rough comments. I mean, the, the context you're talking about, I would ask, what are the research problems you're trying to address? What are the questions? And is this the sort of question where you know, um, a dynamic modeling approach is, is key or the, the sort of questions where a statistical modeling approach or descriptive analysis or qualitative approach might be the first step. Um, I, I, you need to have that dialogue, I think, to get going. And I think lots of people on this call could help, help you with that. Hopefully that's helpful. Thank you very much, uh, Professor. It was good, uh, it was good we know you are- uh... Yeah. <laughs> over time here. Uh, over time here. Thank you so much. We really appreciate appreciate your time again, and and that was really great, uh, interesting work. And looking forward to uh, see more of those in your own uh, conferences and seminars in the summer. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. And I'd like to provide again my thanks to Winchell for his exceptional work and leadership in this area. And we're looking forward to to his uh, sharing it with the community shortly. So thanks very much. It's an honor. And Take care. Thank you. And thank you everyone for attending.